Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. This is Jeff Jones, um, and we're here to talk about making a murderer specifically, um, episode one. Um, I had this idea of, like, how could I get back to basics on this case? And, you know, we all have the documentary, and so my idea was to try to sit down and go through this documentary frame by frame if we have to, and basically just kind of get a fresh start at making a murderer in order to keep this discussion fresh. And um, so today we have, I have uh, quite a few guests to start off. I'll just uh, say hello to everybody and maybe you can, uh, um, you know, unmute and say hello. So yours. is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you just uh, just caught up this uh, this thing again. And uh, yeah, just really go for it. I'm glad to be here. So go for it. Thank you. Uh, Kelly? Kelly? Hey, everyone. Good morning. Very early here in Western Australia. Thanks for inviting me. It's awesome to be here. And it's awesome to be uh, with the people that are here today. It's been a while since I've spoken to everyone, so it's good that we're all in the same group and having a chat. Thanks for yeah. inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. We're going to watch a documentary together. No big deal. Uh, Dr. Silkman. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you for inviting me. It's uh, you got some great panelists, uh, some great people here on the panel, uh, but most important question, are you supplying popcorn? <laughs> well, hey, if this one goes <laughs> off uh, well, Dr. Silkman, I think I could probably uh, probably send everybody a little care package. But, yeah, uh, again, this, this should be a lot of fun. You know, we don't usually get to watch these documentaries together, so it'll be just like sitting back with the popcorn. I have a feeling, and in fact, I know that we're not going to make it very far, but like the first clip before I have to stop it, and I have a comment. So let's just get to it, everybody. Oh, this is a... Here they come. Up the road. So, like, I'm sorry, but I already have to stop it because... This view, the first portion of the entire docu-series, the first clip, this view becomes important later on. Uh, wouldn't you say, Dr. Silkman, if, you're, if you would, if you have any comment on oh, how yeah. this view becomes important? He sure does. And uh, I think uh, viewers need to take note on the left-hand side of the screen are those infamous letterboxes. And to the right is exactly where the bus driver would stop uh, to let off both Blaine and Brendan Dassey at 3.45. So that's a very important shot. Yep. Hey, that, all, that mailbox, uh, that very same mailbox would also be the one uh, that the paper boy, Sawinski, would deliver yep. the uh, newspaper to uh, as and he would have claimed to have seen Bobby Dassey in a very... Uh, unknown bearded man pushing a RAV4 down Avery Road. So that's the same mailbox. Anybody else have anything to add to this shot? Just the importance of it later or uh, anything you I, can think of? Yes. If, if I could just say um, also, Jeff, uh, right down at the uh, very start of Avery Road on the right-hand side as you look in the picture uh, are a set of propane tanks. Uh, that's where the propane tank driver saw a green vehicle looking like a RAV4 uh, drive out. Now, we don't know whether it was Teresa Horbach's RAV4, but the propane tank driver uh, saw a similar looking vehicle drive out from Avery Road. So <laughs> that little stretch of road is uh, extremely controversial, put it that way. That's right. And so I, d I just thought that it was like uh, quite serendipitous that you can't really get but I don't know. Are we five seconds into the into the docu series, and and we have to say this is this is relevant right here. So, um, again, we're not going to be streaming this uh, series. We're going to be picking it apart. Okay. So, any anybody else, or before I move on, 
Uh, yeah, I would just want to point out that uh, Sawinski made the, the comment that, that there was a swerve around the ditch around uh, to the side of the Avery Road, and that's right, well, between the black car and the and the propane tanks you see were somewhere on the right side. There should be a ditch where uh, the car would go around there. Right. So, yeah, that's why this, uh, th this piece of the film is very important. F feel free to talk over the – and now I'm stopping it again. This is the reverse view. This is what – if you're standing where that car is, that's what you'd be seeing. So if, you know, from this window, you see this window in the top corner – you could almost see the road from there, but if you're standing in the driveway, you could, you know, just to give it a little context. How are you doing? Oh, hello. How are you? Oh, pretty good. How's it feel? You're wonderful. I was happy when I got out. I thought I was the happiest man on earth. We knew he was innocent. We knew he was innocent. There it is. Uh, DNA frees a man after 18 years. Comments, quick comments on just the family reaction. She said, we knew. We knew he was innocent because so many people had vouched for his alibi. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing that DNA actually uh, should have exonerated him twice because uh, the, uh, th there was some DNA result from... Uh, scrapings from Penny Bernstein's uh, fingernails that didn't come back to Stephen Avery. And she's, you know, she said she scratched them, the, the, the assailant. Well, uh, they didn't have the capability in 1985 to do that. When they tested them later, uh, th uh, they, they came back as to not Stephen Avery. And the judge said, well, how am I going to be convinced that, you know, that Penny didn't accidentally scrape up against the first responder. And that's the DNA we're seeing. I just don't believe it. Uh, back to prison for you. Yep, that was Judge Hazelwood, and that occurred in 1996. Uh, unfortunately, back then, uh, the DNA uh, technology wasn't as good, and uh, what Big Jeff said is 100% correct. Um, fingernail scrapings were tested, and there was an allele uh, that was not that didn't belong to uh, either Stephen Avery uh, nor Penny Bernston. And the judge made a 50-50% call. He could have either sided with Stephen Avery and let him free, but he decided, nah, that's not good enough evidence, and unfortunately sent him back to prison. Yep, 1996. What a shame. Law enforcement despised Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was a shiny example of their inadequacies, their misconduct. No one ever intended to do anybody any harm by this. Uh, uh, we firmly believe that we had the uh, guilty party at the time. I, what a crock! <laughs> we, we, there's evidence. That, you know, as I said, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff in this case. I don't know a lot about anything in this case. But we have evidence pointing to the contrary now, don't we? Yeah. yeah we, 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 we absolutely do. As a matter of fact, you know, for all, for all the guilters who may, may watch this, one of the primary pieces of evidence we have is from Michael Griesbach. Who's Michael Griesbach? Michael Griesbach is the, is the assistant uh, district attorney for Manitowoc County at, at this time, who actually, um, uh, the, 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 the district attorney for Manitowoc, after Stephen Avery got released, his name was Mark Rohr, is the one that went to the uh, Department of Justice and said, hey, well, you know, this guy is obviously exonerated after 18 years. Maybe we should do an investigation into what happened. So that was done by Mark Rohr. Mike Griesbach was the assistant district attorney. Uh, and Mike Griesbach has written a book called Indefensible, uh, in which he makes some very poignant comments about the DA that convicted Stephen, whose name was Dennis Vogel. We can get to that. But he also makes some explosive uh, comments about uh, Tom Kasurik, who was the Manitowoc County Sheriff at, at the time. That's, that's a, um, a picture of Kasurik. I think he may be retired uh, in, by the time that this picture was taken. And that, that accusation is exactly this. This is not in the documentary, this, this accusation. 
And this is from Greasebach. This is from the assistant DA of Manitowoc County, not from a guilter's conspiracy theory, but from his own words that we can put the video in the description. And he says, uh, Greasebach, that we know that Penny Bernstein went to Kisorik uh, before Stephen's trial with the Manitowoc County assistant police uh, chief, whose, whose name was Bergner, uh, at, at the time, to report to say to Kasurik, we do, I don't think that Stephen Avery is the man. This is Penny Bernstein saying this, the victim, because I've been getting phone calls uh, from somebody saying that they that they're the one who did this. That was exactly um, Gregory Allen, the actual perpetrator's mo, was he'd commit crimes like this and he'd contact the victims, and and Greaseback verifies that the assistant uh, police chief of, of uh, Manitowoc County went to the sheriff with Penny Bernstein to say this. And when Kasurik was asked by the investigators, you know, uh, th did he recall that conversation? He said, no. How can you not recall that conversation? That, that, that's just unbelievable, number one. And number two, when you think about it, if you think about the, uh, the testimony that Penny Bernstein gave to convict Stephen, if that, that um, conversation actually did happen, which there's no reason to believe that it didn't because we, we got it from you know, a Manitowoc County official, how much was Penny Bernstein pressured to you know, build, you know, go through with her story, get Stephen Avery, change his eye color, change his height? Um, it's just, uh, it, it's, un it's unthinkable the pressure they had to put on a rape victim to get her to change her mind if she's in Kasurik's office before the trial even happened saying, I don't think it was him. That is an explosive revelation that you don't see on man and a lot of people don't even realize. So with that, I'll stop my rant. That's actually ironic though. You've just brought up her awesome point about that, that, you know, wasn't in the documentary yet. She's going to them before court saying, I don't think this is the guy yet. When Peg does her final report and sees no wrongdoing with the police force and what they're, um, investigation was she actually basically put the blame on Penny because she's the one that identified Stephen Avery yet Penny was saying before trial that it might be the wrong guy like the, yep. look at the the black and white yin and yang in that Jesus but to uh if I could just uh, add a little bit to make matters worse right um Kaserik and also uh, Vogel they had people inside their own offices telling them um I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's um, Stephen Avery here. I, this looks more like Gregory Allen, and that's the problem. Very very early on, that individuals inside the inside the inner sanctum, basically telling Kasserik and also Vogel, this doesn't look like Stephen Avery. This looks like Gregory Allen. And furthermore, of course, Gregory Allen had attacked uh, another person on the exact same stretch of beach. Right, I think about a year prior. So all the red flags were there, and it's remarkable that Kasserik now, uh, you know, puts up his hands and says, "Look, there was no wrongdoing. It was just a simple mistake." Which yeah, which is right. almost like uh, Doctor Silkman, <laughs> some sort of slippage, some sort of Freudian slippage of, "Oh no, we didn't do it on purpose." Like, why did why did he have to say that? I, I you know, just it makes you sound suspicious. Like you're trying to cover up something. If, yeah. if you come out and say, well, we didn't, we, of course we didn't mean anything by it. it. It's the, it's the standard CYA, right? And uh, this is the main problem with law enforcement. Law enforcement stick together no matter what, because if one person goes down, they all go down. Right? So Tom Kasarik, he's the chief honcho. He's got to put a story straight out there. So no one, no one is looking at him. No one is looking at his department. And uh, what Kelly said, and also Big Jeff, is unbelievable that uh, Peg Lockenschlauter, in the end, whitewashed everything, which we'll talk about later. But not only that, she blamed the victim herself for picking out Stephen Avery. It's, you just would not believe her, would you? It's, there you it's go. quite shocking. It's quite shocking. Uh, anybody else uh, to add this part before we move on? 
This was one of the biggest miscarriages of justice I ever good, saw. You know, a good pick of Chucky there. We don't always get to see him in his uh, younger youth. He looks happy to see his brother. In 20 years of criminal defense work and thousands of cases. It was like the same old Steve was back. He was happy. He was smiling. It did tell him, be careful. There was just something I felt. I said, I'm going to talk to he's not done with you. They are not even close to being finished with you. You know, one thing that I notice is uh, maybe look at the amount of cameras that are, that are there at his welcome home party. That just brings the profile of this case right into Manitowoc's face. They don't want to talk about Stephen Avery. They really would prefer to not have all these cameras there. He's happy. He's on TV looking happy. And that's got to bug them, you know, and they know they did wrong. Anybody yeah, it was. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Oh, I was just going to say what Kim just said. I think that was one of the most powerful, like, statements in the entire, one of the entire, ep like, series is when she says they weren't finished with him yet. I think when you when you capture that moment and you pause it right on that and then you go back and you know where we are now, it wasn't over for Stephen. He just didn't know it yet. So really it was always there that it, the, the storm was brewing. Even that <laughs> it's insane. It is. It really is. And that's the kind of, you know, psychological maybe, you know, obviously Stephen hadn't been street smart. He wasn't on the streets for how many years? Um, but she was. She did know what they were up to, and she knew the tone and the tenor of uh, law enforcement in the area, and she knew that they got what they wanted and they got their man, right? So, you know, it is. It, it, it's pretty eerie to see how much she had, uh, how much she had the foresight, and uh, it's unfortunate. Now, one of the third areas we might get to later, something that's always bothered me is, had he just moved out of Manitowoc County during this civil suit process, you know, it's just, I wish, I wish he would have been able to just live in Krivitz or something or had not been around for man, you know, outside of their jurisdiction to even mess with, but you know, I can't go back. No, but, um, and, and you are, you are correct. Um, Jeff, in terms of, uh, the MTSO, Kasurik, Vogel, and all of them, uh, they would have been horrified by the attention that Stephen Avery was, was gathering. And don't forget, uh, this was a huge success for the uh, Innocence Project, right? They uh, took on his case. Uh, they uh, obtained uh, the uh, forensic DNA samples, the uh, pubic hair that was eventually tested by Cherie Cohane. It only took her one whole year to do a one-day experiment <laughs> But, uh, yeah, look, the spotlight was firmly on Stephen Avery, his family, but also Sari and the MTSO. <laughs> this wasn't good. Can I Anyone else? Make, <clears throat> yeah, yeah please, can I just please. make a quick point? Because um, I'm, I'm just curious, because this, this took about two years between the date that he got released and the date that he got, you know, uh, in the prison again. Mm -hmm. Why did it take him two years, two whole years, to do that? Uh, you you mean like to to set him up again? Yeah. They had to. Uh, I I would dare say they were probably looking for the right opportune moment. But the game changer, we mustn't forget, the game changer was the civil lawsuit, the thirty six million dollar civil lawsuit. I think Stephen would have lived in peace and harmony, except. He decided he was going to take on the sheriff, Vogel, and the MTSO. That's that, right. wasn't going to, that wasn't going to work out good for him, unfortunately. The thing is, before the incident with Teresa, they were still picking at him and looking for things. We have a Marie situation that they were looking into. And then there was that report where a little girl had been taken and yes. Stephen Avery gets mentioned in that as well. Someone says, oh, that... Is Stephen could be Stephen Avery, so he was never out of 
their radar even when he got free before even Teresa. They were they were there. They were always lingering in the background, yeah, just looking. Right. But yeah. Barb had Barb had a vehicle stolen uh, a year before that. Yes. And burned. Stephen Avery's name is it's it's and th there was no link to Stephen ever. Uh, but that that um, question is, is still on his record. Uh, it says it's in, in being associated with the theft of that auto. Right. All right. Anything else? So we'll move on. We filed Stephen Avery's lawsuit about a year after the DNA had come through, indicating that he had not committed the crime. Which, you know, to keep stopping it, but here, here is an, an important point. Like it, was a, it was a year after that DNA came through. And this is one of the things that I brought up to you guys in the panel before is we have Wisconsin's super lawyer, number rated number one lawyer, right? How many number one lawyers has Stephen Avery had? That's the question on Jeopardy. And it seems like he's had all of them and none of them seem to be able to do anything for him. Yet they all think he's innocent. They all would put money on it, right? Yes. Dr. Uh, Silver, anything? Yeah. Yeah. The the other quick point that I want to uh, point out here, an image an image like this would have definitely terrified Kaserik and the MTSO, because if you have a look at the image that you showed uh, previously, when Stephen got out of prison, you know he was overweight, stocky, uh, big full beard, ZZ top beard. He looked very very rough and beaten down. You look at him now, he's looking really sharp. He looks great. Same with Jody. And, you know, his hair looks good. He's got a nice modern haircut. He's obviously lost a lot of weight, showing a lot of confidence. And look at the guy standing next to him on, on, on his right-hand side. you got the best of the best right there. And you know that Stephen now means action, right? This is going to terrify the MTSO. <laughs> The defendants are Manitowoc County, Thomas Kusorik, who was the sheriff at the time in 1985, and Dennis Vogel, the district attorney of Manitowoc County, again at the time in 1985. There is a these are the these are the players. These are the main players in in the depositions. Although there were other others included. Anybody to add anything? Uh, yeah, if I could just make a quick comment. These were the big guys, right? These were the big guys. These weren't just some trivial attorneys or some type of police officer. You're talking about you're talking about the head of the MTSO back then, Kasserik. You're talking about a, a very um, well-known district attorney in Vogel, right? So you can see that the big fish were just about to be fried, and it's all coming from a relatively simple guy who used to live on a junkyard that's pretty embarrassing thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah just, in, just in case it wasn't clear um Kasurik's deposition was not was scheduled i think for november 10th if i'm not mistaken uh and stephen avery was arrested on november 9th and vogels was scheduled for a week later uh, because Ed, Ed Loy was um, kind of um, uh, keeping the, you know, was was kind of working his way, as you guys have suggested, towards the towards the big fish, right? Because uh, Sir Vogel were individually named on that suit. So yeah, the the, um, the depositions were definitely aimed at going down the road towards the really pointing at the malfeasance by those two. Uh, but they had not been deposed yet, and and Stephen Avery is literally arrested a day before the Kasurik deposition. What a shock! Correct. Correct. Between simple mistakes for which officers like that are immune, and purposeful conduct that violates constitutional rights for which they're not immune. In the purposeful conduct, um, in the beginning, one of the first things that we mentioned what, when Kasurik is first on film in this docuseries he says well we didn't mean anything by it he's already trying to cover it this is the conduct they're talking about correct 
little bit more well, that, that's exactly right and, and uh you know if i if i could paraphrase from uh from mike greaseback's book indefensible uh he basically says that he had a phone call uh with with vogel and vogel asked him in the phone call was anything on gregory allen in the file uh you know re re related related to the rape because Vogel right. himself had handled that original that that original um, case that Dr. Silkman mentioned with regard to the other woman that was attacked along the same stretch of beach, and of course there was you know there was information on Greg Gregory Allen in the file, but Griesbach outright says that the only possible way for him to interpret that is that Vogel knew he knew yeah. it was Gregory Allen all along, uh, and it just it shocks um, it sh it shocks Griesbach to his core. Because he said he was confident, there, there's no doubt in his mind that Vogel knew he was prosecuting the wrong person. Uh, and, and by extenuation, he knew that Kasurik also knew. Uh, and that right. was his whole point of doing that. So there is no um, you know, the deliberate action um, is, is exactly what I put this guy away. I knew he was the wrong guy. I didn't care uh, because he needed to go because he, he did something wrong to a sheriff's, de sheriff deputy's wife who happened to be his cousin. So Correct. what do you Thanks think was a turning um, point for Greaseback was? He was so adamant that he understood what was going on, yet now he thinks Stephen's guilty. Like it's what went wrong there with him. If he needs, knows that they can do it the first time, why can't he see past it the second time? Well, in his book, he basically says that there's there's no other person who had the, you know, the, the means and opportunity. Yeah, and and, uh, of course, the evidence. So. Yep. Uh, I, I read the same book, and, uh, uh, and I echo what Big Jeff just said. Um, if you have a look at his book, Griesbach's book, um, you're not going to get a better account of what happened uh, in the 1985 case because Griesbach was right there. He was amongst that. He was in the offices. He was talking to people. So the best account you're going to get of the 1985 case is through Griesbach. However, the second part of his book, which talks about the uh, murder of uh, Teresa Horbach, is possibly one of the most biggest piece of garbage I have ever read. I, 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 read the, I read the entire book. His first part of the book involving the Penny Bernstein sexual assault is on point brilliant. But it looks like he rushed the second part of his book when it came to... Um, talking about the murder of Teresa Horbach. He just basically towed the party line. Oh, yeah, Steve did it. I don't know why he did it, but yet he's guilty. I think Griesbach jumps on what's winning at the time, right? So he's okay. He's okay to nail Kasserik and Vogel. But at the same time, as Big Jeff said, he's fine to ride the coattails and say, yep, Stephen's a murderer without thinking jeepers you know i just spent all this time talking about what happened to him in 1985 how he was set up and yet you can't see the past the obvious that maybe they were going to set him up again but this time for murder you know the the boldness of that action dr silkman just makes me think they knew they could get away with it and that makes me think had they done something like this before? Now, that's a bigger conversation for later, but where do you get the, <laughs> the bold cojones to think that you can just do, well, as long as, as long as you put this paper in this file, well, that guy will get, con we got a confession. Everything's, we got a confession or we have an eyewitness and, oh, done deal. Slap your hands together and say, and, and so that's what makes me wonder, Where's the well, integrity in the office? There is there. How can no. we trust that their other cases, even the ones when they got the right person or whatever, that it was conducted properly? And that should scare everyone. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head, uh, and that's what it is. That's exactly what the civil lawsuit was designed to do. The the civil lawsuit would have opened up the entire MTSO. It would have had a look at um, Kasserik, at uh, the time when he was sheriff. And it would have opened up all the prior cases. I mean, Jeff, you just said it. There would have been an investigation. 
especially looking into things like the uh, Ricky Hochschletter case and other um, cases that occurred uh, when he was the boss. And potentially he knew that his whole career was on the line. That civil suit, that was the game changer. These were desperate people. And uh, yep, in my honest belief, they were desperate enough to set him up for murder and send him back to prison. Yeah, I, I concur with that, uh, Dr. Silkman, 100%. And I, I do believe that there are law enforcement officers who can sleep very well at night knowing that maybe, you know, maybe I didn't get him for this one or maybe the evidence was planted for this one. But you know what? That family tree only has one branch and he's the, 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 the community as a whole is better off with him in the hole than with him out uh, running around. I know he's guilty of something. Even if he's not guilty of this because he's just a scumbag. He belongs in jail and, and I'm going to sleep very well tonight. I, I think that's an attitude that um, uh, is prevalent among a lot of small town law enforcement. I was going to say just uh, two very quick points. Remember, they had the attorney general on their side, right? And they also got uh, immunity, right? And that's exactly what uh, Tom Kaserik was alluding to. Hey, it was an innocent mistake. And that's what the civil lawsuit uh, gentleman said. Hey, if you make an honest mistake, I could understand it, right? However, this was a targeting of Stephen Avery right from the get-go in 1985. Oh, I was just going to agree what um, Dr. Silkman said and Big Jeff, but for me, again, with the civil suit, I don't think it was ever about the money for them. I don't think they gave, gave a shit what was going to be paid out to him. It was what was beyond that, the can of worms being opened and how everything would have just started to tumble against them. And I think that's what their driving force would have been not so much the money. That's my opinion. I know people do a lot of crazy shit for a lot less money, like 20 bucks. People kill people and people can hurt people and do some nasty stuff. But for me personally, I just don't think money was the driving motive to get Stephen Avery. I think it was more of a dignity and ego and all this, oh, my God, he can't, we can't let him win versus, oh, my God, we're going to lose money. I just – personally, that's how I've seen it when I've looked into it. Of course, it doesn't help that, that they would be responsible for, you know, paying him out, but I just don't think that was what made them go, hey, listen, let's frame this bloke. Another thing that you should be concerned about is the power structure, right? Uh, if, if you look at what was going on, uh, you know, on the political side, there were there was something getting passed through the Wisconsin legislature called the Avery Bill, uh, aimed at um, you know sort of what the heck went on here, uh, and um, you know when both sides of the aisle start to agree on a certain topic, you can bet that the full force of government is going to start to come down on you know and, and rain on your parade very hard, and and that's going to very much impact the power structure of the sheriff's office, which in these corrupt small town kind of you know, cabals uh, can be really be the source of a lot of economic power. And, uh, you know, that's something that would have got ripped up. And uh, I, th I think that that is as much, you know, as, as, as much a thing to preserve if you're the people who are in power uh, as, um, you know, as, any, as anything else. So I, I, I think it's not necessarily uh, about the money so much as it is about the power structure and, and the desire to preserve that. Because uh, you can will, you can get a lot of money if you if you wield a lot of political power. Over. Uh, the, the, yeah, that's an excellent point. But the the other thing is, um, have a look at the asymmetry that you've got here, right? You've got the small guy, Stephen Avery. You know, was in prison for a long period of time, uh, works on a junkyard, and now he's taken on the big guys, right? So the the, the main issue for the likes of Caserik and Vogel was the attention and scrutiny that was going to come their way had the civil lawsuit been successful. And my understanding was that um, uh, some, of the, some of the civil suit would have been paid out by insurance companies, but some of it would have come from the pockets of Kaserik and Vogel.
But the other important point that we mustn't forget uh, is that scrutiny would have been placed on the Wisconsin State Crime Lab and other crime laboratories under the auspices of um, the county, right? So you already know, uh, later on we'll talk about it, that Butin had a lot of concerns about the shenanigans that were happening in Wisconsin State Crime Lab, right? So imagine if you open up the crime labs to scrutiny, right? Potentially, you can have people who are in prison, who've been put in prison because of forensic evidence done by, say, Cherie Cohane and other laboratory techs. All of them are putting up their hands and saying, hey, what about me? So it would have had a massive domino effect they could have destroyed, literally destroyed the county. This was huge. This is brown, yeah. Feeling Even confident. Even though there's no guarantee that Stephen Avery will win this case, he says it's still worth going through the trial just to hold somebody accountable for taking 18 years of his life. They have to have an inspector and I can do it. Nobody said anything. I don't see what I really did wrong to the sheriff for him to pick on me like that. The only thing I can think of is I ran my cousin off the road. There it is. Okay, before we play this part, comments on Sandra Morris? Anybody? <laughs> Troublemaker. <laughs> Never in their right minds did any of them ever think they will be sitting in a civil suit deposition with a camera on them. Never. They would have thought, they all would have thought, Stephen's in prison, no problems. This came as a huge shock to all of them. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you back? Yes. Man, I'm going to show you that. You have to think about the, now, 1984. It's important to remember when this takes place. 1984, running, being run off the road was only a year prior. It's, this wasn't, this yes, was right. still burning hot, is my point. This this confrontation with Stephen was burning hot at this point. It was new. It was fresh. It was not something from when we were teenagers. It wasn't from years before. I think that that's sometimes that I it's lost on me how re, how tightly together these are scheduled, right? Like how close she was upset and she was looking for a reason, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I mean, she, she's married to a, a manic she deputy sheriff. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's the real reason that, that, that through the full weight of the sheriff's department, it's Steven, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to tolerate this to one of our boys. This is, this can't, this will not stand. He has been known to masturbate on the hood of the car as she is driving past. You see that? Yes. Did you tell that to the police? Um, I didn't put it in that many words. I didn't. He didn't masturbate on the hood of my car, but he did come out in front of my car, and he was doing. His Does anybody really believe this? <laughs> no. no, I mean, look, you know, all, all all jokes aside, right? All jokes aside, you know, you know who she's describing to a T. Guess who she's describing to a T who definitely would do stuff like that? Who do you reckon? I don't know. Gregory Allen? Gregory fucking Allen. Oops. Sorry about that. Yep. That's exactly Gregory Allen's MO. He, he routinely was doing stuff like that. And, you know, all jokes aside, right? Remember Penny Bernstein? What she said? Oh, I, I, I couldn't. She couldn't tell the difference between Stephen and Gregory Allen. Well, he, uh, well, what about um, Sandra Morris? Could she tell the difference between Stephen and Gregory Allen at five o'clock in the morning on a Wisconsin winter? Yeah, right. Penny, Penny Bernstein's attacker was within inches of her face. 
and she still got it wrong. Right. I think it was also um, important for law enforcement to somehow start planting the seeds um, that Stephen uh, was a sex, some type of sexual predator. So th there's, there's really no complaints in his criminal history uh, about him being uh, a sexual predator. I mean, there's, there's complaints that he you know, robbed the store, um, that he uh, you know, uh, beat up his girlfriend. Um, to my knowledge, there's no, um, there's no complaints that he raped any women. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this, this is sort of the first dropping that, oh, yeah. And, and you, 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 need, you need that. You, you need to sort of sow that seed in order to begin to get a jury to believe that, um, you know, that he is, uh, you know, just going to rape and murder some woman that shows up to his house. So, um, yep. yeah. But, but uh, Big Jeff, in, this is where the guilters like to extend things, right? They, they, I've heard a lot of discussions in which guilt is saying, oh, yeah, but Stephen Avery put a gun on his cousin with the intention of raping her, right? With the intention of raping her. So Stephen did this, which was completely stupid, in order to teach her a lesson. Hey, stop spreading rumors about me. But the guilters want to extend it one extra little bit and say, yeah, his intentions were to rape her, right? So as you said, Big Jeff, that now extends his background character as a would-be rapist, right? When they already had one in Gregory Allen right in their face and they completely ignored him, but they went after Stephen. So that, I think that's, that's a very a important point. point. Very good point. You hit the nail on the head with that one. And like yeah. they like to extend it to, oh, look, now <laughs> yeah. you can see he has a violence towards women. Correct. That, Correct. That's the biggest one that I see all the time. This is just Correct. another pattern of his behaviour and what he has, the views he has on women. Ra ra ra. And that's exactly what Ken Kratz consistently portrayed Stephen as being a, someone who had an issue with women all the time. The only, you know, again, I'm not a body language expert. I'm just a human who reacts to other humans. But this uh, Sandra Morris does not smile in this deposition, except for when she's talking about Stephen Avery pleasuring himself. Now, why is she smiling during that part? That should be the part where she's grossed out, right? Because either she likes it, number one, which according to her, she doesn't like it. And or number two, this is the lie that she's telling and she knows she's getting away with one. So it's it's kind of fun to tell this tale. And that's well, how I'm reading it. Yeah, but not a, not only that, by extension, what is she spreading as rumors in the bars that she frequents? Oh, I see him bare ass having sex with his wife on the grass, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all part of uh, the uh, scenario that she's building up against the they're coming up with all types of stories to target Stephen and make him look like an animal. That's precisely what they're doing. Yeah, I'd just like to reaffirm that I, th I think she did that. She told that lie in support of the setting Stephen to be more rapey for the 1985 case. And I don't believe it ever happened. Um, but making, you know, making that comment um, and having to lie to it again and having to repeat that lie is probably the source of the sour look on her face. Like, I can't believe you're making me say this again, this lie. It's coming back to haunt me. And that, to me, that's the source of that body language. Over. This is why you're driving 40 miles an hour by his house? He did, he did run out towards the road. He was prepared. He had it all ready. Okay. It's... He has had sexual relations with his wife out on the lawn. Dad, I have nothing. Let me I... just finish the question. While all the neighbors are home in the daytime and able to watch. Dad, I didn't say at all. Okay. It seems strange. Why would she? Anyway, I, I don't understand her psychology, but. Do you have any Oh, I definitely didn't say that. Why wouldn't anybody else complain about it? All these neighbors and no nobody complains about it. Why? 
Oh, that's why. That's probably why she's like, oh, I have to backtrack on that point. That's a good yeah. good point there. Thank you. Uh, uh, hold, on, you hold, on, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. There's, a, there's another important point, too. Guess who happened to be Stephen Avery's other neighbor at the time? Oh, I can't think of it now. Judy Dvorak. Right. So, uh, <laughs> isn't, isn't, be Jeff, isn't that an interesting coincidence, right? Ju Judy Dvorak, the one who said uh, during the 1985, uh, um, this, when Penny Bernstein read the description, uh, she said, oh, that sounds like Stephen Avery. That's yeah. like that, Stephen Avery. That Judy Dvorak? <laughs> the one that says, not my verbiage. That yeah. One. Not no, not another Judy Dvorak, that one. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Was there a period where you were spending time in a nearby tavern and talking about Stephen Avery? I might have. <laughs> I might have went to several taverns. In 1985, were you personally friendly with Stephen Avery? No. In fact, you actively disliked him. Is that right? At that time? Yeah. First piece of truth we've heard out of her. I tend to agree with that line. At first, she's like, should I deny it? Should I? No. I hate him so much. I can't even lie and say that we were friends or that we were cordial or that I associated with him. Like that's how deep the, I think that's what I read is the just the deep hatred. Just yeah, I got the same note. Okay. And you weren't quiet about it. Knew he was harmless. He was always happy, 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 always laughing, always wanted to make other people laugh. I think the people on the outside community viewed him as an Avery, you know, viewed him as troublemaker. You know, there goes another Avery. They're all trouble. Now, this this is this is something that's persisted even to this day, that there's this constant, you know, and I've been on other podcasts and I've had discussions and we've seen what this aura around the Avery's that exists of they're all bad. And if you, if, if any of you feel like touching on it, this comes from a place of, yes, there have been incidences of the other brothers. Yes. There have been domestic incidences. And then, then there's been off the record stuff, rumors about, the way the family abused each other in, in various different ways. But this is just more of characterizing them as just another Avery. And I just wonder if anybody has any insight into that, where, where does this come from? Where does this lead? I know we've seen a lot of uh, um, incident reports in the past. Anybody have anything to add to that? I, I think, uh, you know, if we, if we fast forward, uh, to uh, the, the the to Brendan's um, uh, you know the the, hear, the hearing that he got uh, you know in, in his uh, motion to dismiss the uh, confession, the person who was supposedly on his side, who worked for his lawyer, his lawyer's name was Len Kaczynski. Len, Len Kaczynski hi hired a you know, a, I guess you'd call him a detective whose name was Mike O'Kelly. Uh, Kaczynski and O'Kelly together did Brendan more harm than, than any good. One thing that Brent, that O'Kelly writes, you know, as, as Brendan's advocate, right? He's supposed to be Brendan's advocate. He writes that he, that, that family tree only has one branch, um, you know, referring to some type of uh, incest. Uh, and needs to be stopped in its place. And, and so when you ask where that type of uh, reputation, where does that lead? That leads to Mike O'Kelly uh, acting against Brendan uh, because he believes that, uh, you know, what, what, whatever, whatever rumor he hears is, is true. 
and it is, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's not, it's criminal and it's awful. Manitowoc County is working class farmers and the Avery family, they weren't that. They dealt in junk. They had a salvage yard. They lived on Avery Road. I mean, they had their own road and stuff. They didn't dress like everybody else. They didn't have education like other people. They weren't involved in other community activities. I don't think it ever crossed their mind that they should try to fit into the community. They fit into the community they had built, and that was enough. Growing up with other cars, you know, it's pretty fun. Tear them apart, fixing them. Run around in the trails, in the rolls of the cars. Once we had a car up there in the back with the motor out and everything else, and we had a bed back there. And then we had a battery in it so we could listen to the radio, talk, goof around. You know, I had a nice childhood. The family sticks together. They have a very strong sense of family. Uh, they support each other. Okay, comments about Hazelwood? <laughs> He's a big dickhead. That's what he is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's quite clear. It's quite clear that um, the family have had a long history with uh, Judge Hazelwood, and he's the he's the one that made all those uh, 50 50 decisions against Stephen Avery in 1996, with the uh, forensic DNA that was obtained by I think it was done by LabCorp, uh, and he had the ability to, uh, with the stroke of a pen, to release Stephen Avery in 1996. Now, this is where it comes into, into point. Because of Stephen Avery's background, character, family history, Judge Hazelwood said, I'm not releasing you, back to prison. And so Stephen went back to prison in 1996, even though the DNA evidence showed that uh, Penny Bernson had DNA from another person underneath her fingernails. And don't forget, you need to scratch someone in order to get skin cells underneath your fingernails. Yet Judge Hazelwood, he sided on the side of the state.